the Lord. Thank you again, dear brothers, for your help up here. Praise the Lord. And I'd like to ask that we go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. The title of the message is Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. And we're going to read from chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Luke 3, 1 through 9. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be straight, shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I want you to notice, please, that ninth and tenth, uh, that ninth verse again. And let's leave verse nine on the screen. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the Fire. Now, of course, this scripture is pointing to John the Baptist. Jesus said, among women, there was no man greater born in the realm of this earth than John. And what a commendation. What a word from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to say such a thing about this mighty prophet who we know as John the the Baptist. And I want to talk to you a little bit first about John. I want to share with you something that is made available to you and I through the word of the prophets, what God has given us, something that you and I have hold of, which is truth, something that you and I have hold of, which never expires. There's never an expiration date. There are no events, no current events, no civil, social, political, religious, military, no events that will ever render this word null and void. This word transcends all time. Every word that we will ever see speaks clearly, properly, prophetically to every generation. And you and I have been given this. And one of the greatest blessings of our biblical history including all of human history, and especially the Jewish nation, is the long line of the prophets. We can understand the function of the prophet by how the Word of God describes them to us. All through the Word, prophets are described to us. I'll just bring you a few to understand why we're now leading up to today's message with John the Baptist, this mighty prophet. 
We learn from the word of God that the prophet was a seer, S-E-E-R, a seer. That simply means one who sees, one who sees, not just sees what is, not just sees what is evident to everybody, but he sees what only the Spirit of God could, could cause and anoint and allow a person to see. It's a spiritual vision. It's a spiritual eyesight. Also, the prophet was called a man of the Spirit. The Bible describes prophets to us as men of the Spirit. And this speaks of one who, through the Spirit of God, declared the will and purpose of God. So we have the seer, one who has spiritual clarity in vision. We have the Bible describing prophets as a man of the Spirit, those who by the Spirit of God declare the will and the purpose of God. We also learn that he was called a man of God. This speaks of a man wholeheartedly devoted to God. Prophets, men of God, wholeheartedly devoted to God and speaks with the authority of God, the messages of God. So we have seer, we have men of the spirit, and man of God. And of course, we see them in men like Samuel and Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, just to name a few. But as powerful as this succession of prophets was, none of them was greater than the last of the long line of prophets, and his name was John the Baptist, who was the immediate forerunner for Jesus. Now, I'm not just giving you history here or, 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 or semantics for a lesson. I want you to see prophetically what is made available to us in the prophetic voice that needs to be in the church as we operate in this office as we declare, behold the Lamb and the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is something that we don't just see historically. This is something we see now, something we see presently, something we see currently, something we need to see operating in our lives. And as the description of the true prophet bears out, John's message resulted from his vision. He saw clearly, and therefore he spoke with authority. Why? Because he was wholeheartedly devoted to the will of God. His clear-seeing message got the attention of the entire nation. So what are we seeing? You have to be able to see clearly. You have to be wholeheartedly devoted to the word of God. And as a result, seeing clearly and having that devotion, you will speak with authority the word of the Lord. Now, I want to just back up a moment and say to you, my friends, the only way to speak with authority to anything, of anything, concerning anything, in regard to anything, is to be speaking the word of the Lord. There is no other authority, no other dialogue, no other discourse, no other vocabulary that can cut through the layers and dimensions of darkness that are coming into ever-increasing, ever-developing, ever-blossoming reality in the very days and times in which you live. The authority of the Word of God must be the Word that we speak, but it must come from that type of a spirit, that type of a devotion, that type of a dedication. Yes, just as we see in the prophet, who were men of the Spirit, men of God, and seers. They could see clearly and accurately. Why does God give people that type of spiritual and prophetic vision? Because all they want to do is look wholeheartedly into the word of the Lord. When you look wholeheartedly into the word of the Lord, you will be able to see wholeheartedly, specifically, everything taking place in your lifetime. Now John understood the calamity of his day. 
He was in no way deceived by the actual condition of his nation. He spoke clearly concerning the moral condition and the sinfulness of the nation. And then toward the end of his work, he was given the vision of the coming Savior, which brought about his last and mightiest messages. If you follow John the Baptist's ministry, you will see that he first, through clear seeing, spoke messages that were fiery, dealing with sin, dealing with every condition of the nation at every multifaceted layer and dimension and arena of society. He spoke clearly to it. But then the, his vision was enlarged because he was stewarding the message he was given. The message was then enlarged, and he began now to get a vision for the coming of the Lord. And these messages marked his last and mightiest messages. This is exactly what will be happening in the reality of the remnant church. That as we steward the word of the Lord, speaking in righteousness, speaking in love, but nevertheless speaking the word unhesitatingly, unapologetically to the neighborhood, to the region, to the nation, as we deal with the condition of this nation, believe me when I tell you, God's going to fill you prophetically with a fresh vision and a fresh understanding of the soon coming of the Lord, and then that will begin to mark your tone, your vocabulary, your very witness. There's something profoundly important that we must notice here concerning John the Baptist. And it is how the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, introduces him. And you'll understand God, his heart, and you in your generation by seeing, of all things, this introduction. Let's take a look at it. Go to the first and second sentence of this chapter, please. Luke chapter 3. Now, 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 now just take a look at this. In the 15th year of the reign of, here we see Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, a governor, Judea of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, another Tetrarch. Then we see Lysanias, another Tetrarch. And then we see the two uh, high priests there, which were um, Annas and Caiaphas, right? Now, now take a look at those two verses. And what do we see here? One Roman emperor, one Roman governor, three tetrarchs, two high priests, and all of that, all of that power, all of that authority, all of those names, the fullness of that power structure, politically and religiously, all of that was made use of to mark the hour in which the word of God came to John the Baptist. All of that. Now, you hear all of these names getting thrown around today. Political names, authority here and there. This ruler, that emperor, this governor, that senator, this side, that side. This thing happening politically. That thing happening socially. This thing happening religiously. All these names. Yet, God cuts through the swamp. And all he says is, all of that surrounds my activity in the earth. All of that the Holy Spirit used to mark when the word of God came to John the Baptist, my friends. To the men of those days, including the men of our day. Any one of those political or religious names would have counted for much higher consideration. Because that's where people's focus is. They're always focused on the latest emperor, the latest governor, the latest senator, the latest representative, the latest mayor, the latest slogan, the latest social, political, religious leader, the latest voice, the latest move. That's where the focus is. That's where the consideration is. But in God's economy, in God's way of doing things, they're all simply used to mark the hour of the most important event which is the word of God coming to a man to announce the coming of the Son of God. My friends, this is a prophetic vision God wants to give each of you afresh. Everything you're seeing today, 
all of the names, all of the back and forth, all of the division, all of the lies, all of the fake news, all of the slogans, all of it. God has only one thing in mind, bringing the, water, bringing the word of the Lord to his church with prophetic vision to announce the coming of the Son of God. In the estimate of heaven, the greatness of John is revealed by the fact that the word not only uses all these other men to mark the hour, but also the word of God passed over all the other rulers of the day. Passed over all of them. I want to tell you something. I'm not a fan of any politician. I'm not a fan of any religious leader. I'm not a fan of any social leader. I am a servant and disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the total wholehearted focus of my life and ministry. That is our testimony. That should be your testimony. The word of God passed over all of them. Governors, emperors, senators, high priests, tetrarchs. The word of God passes over all of it. To mark the move of God in the earth. Passes over all of them. To come to who? A camel-wearing, locust-eating man of God in the wilderness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't you love the Lord? The natural mind tends to focus upon the emperors and governors and rulers of their day. That's where the natural mind tends to go. You know why there's anxiety? Even in Christianity, they're focused on the emperors and the rulers of the day. That's where the natural mind tends to go. They focus on all that. But God calls us above the swamp of those considerations and helps us to see where our hearts should always be focused. And that is the true and prophetic word, which speaks to and lifts up the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and points to the coming of the Lord. I want to ask you a question. I'm sure I'm going to get a pretty good response. How many know Jesus is coming back for us one day? I could end right there, and that's good news. Some of you are thinking that would be good news if you ended right there. He's coming back. This was the vision and burden and message of John, a true, great, and mighty prophet of God. Now, it's equally important for us today to see and declare with clarity the message that John brought. First, he had a great awareness of the sin of the people. And secondly, he had an overwhelming sense that something was approaching. See? First, he had a, a great insight and awareness of the sinful condition of the people and the nation. And secondly, he had an overwhelming sense that something was approaching. See? Those two parts of his ministry, they're vitally important. The two and great aspects of John's ministry was first, his sense of sin. And secondly, his sense of the absolute coming of a divine encounter upon the earth. This was his focus. He was anointed to discern sin and speak to it and an overwhelming sense of a coming divine encounter. He had a true vision of the people as they really were. Not what the local headlines said it was, not what this political uh, newscast said it was, or that political newscast, or this newspaper owned by this person, or that magazine. No, no, no. John had a sense of what was taking place in the realm and condition of his environment based on the Spirit of God. He was a seer, a man of the Spirit, a man of God. The Word of God gave him clarity, insight. He read between the lines. God took him up out of the swamp that surrounded him, and he saw clearly what needed to be seen, and as a result, spoke to it with absolute prophetic and powerful understanding. His understanding of the signs of the times was so clear and perfect 
that he knew that he was at the same time standing at the end of something behind him, while at the same time at the very beginning of something new and powerful coming upon the earth. And I want to say to you today, that's exactly where we are now. You are all living in a generation where something that was is going away and something new is coming. Now that's in varying degrees of the earth in a very horrible way, but of the kingdom of God in a very necessary and powerful way. But that's where you are. You're at the end of something that was, and you're on the verge of something new that's about to begin. This is exactly where John was. His awareness of the sin of the people is seen in the very stinging words he uses to address them. He calls them the offspring of vipers. Now, if you want to get some idea of how those words sounded in the ears of these listeners, just imagine someone today standing before a compromising and sinful congregation of people, varied people, and looking into the faces of those multitudes and then deliberately calling them the offspring of vipers. I thought people said, I brought a hard word. <laughs> and remember, the Gospels teach us, remember, the Gospels teach us that this word was spoken to the multitudes. This was not spoken to one exclusive dimension of society. He wasn't just looking at gangbangers, prostitutes, drug addicts. All Judea went out to hear him. Herod went out to hear him. Herod, royalty was mingled with the masses. All sorts and conditions of men stood together and listened to these burning words that came from the lips of this prophet. And as he's looking over these multitudes, knowing the true condition of their hearts and minds, knowing them clearly, he calls them the offspring of vipers. Now I know that that's heavy, and at the same time as I say it, there's a little bit of levity to it, a little bit of giggle here or there, and I, I understand that, but I want you to see it clearly in the realm of its biblical impact that what he's seeing is not just what he's saying to them, he's seeing the slithering reality of the enemy that he's up against. He sees it's breeding more and more and more. That they're the offspring. It's a brood of vipers. He's seeing it spiritually. And it's a heavy, dark, and evil thing. I rebuke that fly in Jesus' name. He's looking at them, and, he, and this is the thing that I want to encourage you in today. When you're seeing everything that you're seeing, please remember, watch your heart, watch your hatred, watch your bitterness, watch your stress, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're up against demon powers, satanic powers, animating these people to be sure. But he spoke to the multitudes. You see, he had insight. It wasn't just about sorting out. He had a different response. I'll show you that in a moment to different questions from different arenas of society. Yes, he had a certain response. But when he spoke that word, he spoke it to the multitudes. The gospel's market, as well as religious leaders in this crowd. He spoke it to the religious leaders who merely had an outward form and ceremony. They, they are among those who had that form of godliness, but they denied the power. They were devoid of the very life and essence of faith. They denied the spiritual realm. They were religious, but they denied the spiritual realm. They had no essence of the true life and power of God. Others not only denied the power, but they even held the very form in contempt. They didn't believe in anything. They didn't believe in order. They didn't believe in the, the structure of God's word and doing things rightly. 
They, they were all over the place. John saw it. In other words, some had form without power, while others had a disgust for the form, including no power. And these were the religious folks. And there they all were. There they all were, full of untold corruption and about to fall into utter ruin. I wonder who is actually and accurately able to discern this very same terrible condition in the varied forms and presentations of religion and Christianity today. Because we have them en masse. People that have a disgust for order, and at the same time they have no power. Others who have a form, but deny the power. The blind, leading the blind. Is that strong enough to describe them? No, because John the Baptist said, you're the offspring of vipers. Why? Because this is cancerous. One breeds another. Let one slither into your home and bite at you a little bit and start injecting some of that. You become that. You have a form, but you don't realize you're denying the power. John saw it for what it was. You need to see it because this is the generation that you're living in, my friends. And it's ever increasing, ever unfolding, and ever blossoming before your very eyes. John looked at these men and all the people that they had influence over. And he said, you offspring of vipers. Now, why was it such a forceful and heavy language? Where did this come from? The Spirit of God had anointed him with a righteous indignation. The Spirit of God anointed him to do something that was so lacking, to tell the truth as it pertains to the heart and kingdom of God, to tell the truth. John truly and clearly understood the true condition of the multitudes and the nation. Let's look at how accurate and specific his discernment was. Because you need to see this, which leads up to, behold the Lamb. Something has to happen in the life of every believer. This is my prayer for you today through this message. Let's look at how accurate and specific his discernment was by his responses to the various groups of people that questioned him. To one group he said, Bring forth, therefore, these are, this is kind of like the religious group who thought that they were just kind of like, you know, grandfathered in. He said, bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And do not say within yourselves, this is his words, and do not say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Let's put Luke chapter 3, verse 9 back up there, Dave. I want, to, I want to ride that for a while while I'm bringing these words. To one group he said, bring therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And do not say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Now why is he saying this? Because these folks thought that their blood relationship to Abraham, despite all the corruptions of their lives and lifestyles, was all that they needed. Well, we're related to Abraham. They were satisfied religiously, and they prided themselves in their relationship to Abraham. What they didn't understand is that their entire lives and lifestyles contradicted that which is essential to the greatness of Abraham, and that was Abraham's absolute faith in God and absolute obedience to the divine will of God. So they're connected to the man, to the legend by blood, but not at all by lifestyle or thought. Claiming a relationship with Abraham, but not walking in the faith and obedience that Abraham walked in, does you absolutely no good at all. Why do you mention that, Pastor Dave? I'll tell you why. This is the exact same condition with the untold multitudes of Christian believers who will sit in churches and think that, that is enough for salvation. Yet they never walk in the true faith. 
They never develop a walk with the Lord, nor do they have any desire to obey the will of God. Just a Sunday morning fix, ease that conscience, and go back out and do your thing. Same thing, ever increasing. And this is the generation in which we live. When the tax collectors came to John and asked him what they should do, everybody came and said, what should we do? What should we do? Tax collectors came. And they said, what should we do? Here's how he replied. He said, collect no more than is appointed to you. I want you to see what he's speaking to here. Collect no more than what is appointed for you. So what do we see from this? We see that John accurately understood the dishonesty of men. My friends, see this now. The dishonesty of men. They use their influential positions to rob the people. They use their positions of authority to enrich themselves. And without doubt, we see this in just about every dimension of society. Then watch how it flows, and then you'll see your headlines today. Then the soldiers came to him and said, what should we do? And here's what he said to them. Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Now here we see again how clear his discernment was, especially concerning the sin and the violence of these conquering, invading armies. But it speaks to us in type as well. These men were, think of this now, these men were taking by violence things that didn't belong to them, they created false charges against men in order to enrich themselves by the fines that were imposed based upon these false charges. Think about that. I want to repeat that, and then you think it through. They're taking by violence things that did not belong to them. They created false charges against men in order to enrich themselves by the fines that were imposed based upon those false charges. So they have power, they're coming into power, they're enriching themselves even more, they're bringing false charges against others in order to give themselves greater power and greater profit. You think about that a bit. What did John say? Don't intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. But all of these replies show how accurate a knowledge the prophet had of the true condition of the state of affairs of his day. And this absolute sense of sin, you see, clearly being willing to yield to the Spirit of God and discern it and speak to it, it gave birth to the next dimension of his message, which was that of an approaching crisis. Listen to his words in Luke 3, verse 9. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Oh, I pray you'll have eyes to see this. This language is speaking of a coming and swift destruction. This is not the mere pruning of a branch with a small clipper. This is the destruction that comes to the whole corrupted root from the axe itself. This is not the occasional branch in which the signs of decay are manifested. This is showing the entire tree is diseased and that the axe is now being laid to the root in other words, my friends, to so many of the multitudes, it all looked good outwardly, but inwardly, it is decayed. The tree is doomed to absolute and immediate destruction. This was the plight of Jerusalem and Israel, and it came. 
Oh my, it came. It came. It came heavy. They were devastated, decimated. Millions died to rest, thrown into dispersion all throughout the nations. And there wasn't a Jew in Israel until 1,948. It came. 1948. It came. The axe is laid to the root. It's time you stop thinking about the casual pruning of a branch. You need to be thinking, what is God saying to us? However, John's ministry and message had much more to say. He not only spoke to the problem, and he not only spoke to the condition, but he also pointed to the remedy. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Matthew 3, verse 11 and 12. I indeed baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist speaking. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. This is Matthew 3, 11 and 12. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, notice the true prophetic language in this. We see the destructive side of it symbolized by the fan and the fire. The winnowing fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. Look at these words, thoroughly. Clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. See? While at the same time, we see the constructive aspect of it. If you want to say negative or positive, better to say the destructive aspect of it and the constructive aspect of it, which is in being cleansed by fire and the gathering together of that which is precious to God. Now you say, where do I fit in? Well, the Bible says there's vessels of honor in the house, vessels of dishonor in the house. Vessels of dishonor are those that cannot withstand the test of fire. They're wood, hay, and stubble. In the house of God, vessels of dishonor. That fire is coming, not just on the multitudes. He's talking to everyone. So we see that this Jesus, all contained in this same Jesus, is a fire that burns up the dishonor, the wood, the hay, the stubble in the house of God. The lukewarm, the indifferent, the casual, the setback, the hardly ever faithful, the here today, gone tomorrow. Vessels of dishonor. That same Jesus brings another fire which cleanses us and burns out the dross, refines our faith, and, 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 and gathers us together into the Father's house. This is the Jesus you know, love, and worship. This was the true message then, and it must be the true message today. The clear and accurate awareness of sin, the sin of the people, and the nation combined with an absolute awareness of a coming crisis and the clear vision of the deliverer, the remedy, Jesus Christ our Lord, and that he is once again coming to this earth. This is where the heart of the prophetic man of God, man of the Spirit, seer was. And this is where, my friends, you must endeavor to be today. You must have a clear understanding of the sin of the people, the sin of the nation, combined with an absolute awareness of a coming crisis and the clear vision of Jesus Christ, the remedy, the deliverer, and that he is once again coming to this earth. Stand in that office. This is what God wants for you. 
in the midst of all the rulers and emperors and governors and kings of this earth, including all the combined sins of the multitudes and the nations, including all of the chaos and activities taking place here in America and around the world, the focus, the passion of the true church should always and only be upon the Lord and the head of the church. And that the same Jesus who cleanses us by fire and refines our faith and gathers us into the Father's house is the same Jesus who will burn away all the wickedness and chaff of this world, including the religious hypocrisy. And we see John, then, and then, then, then we see John makes his greatest pronouncement in John chapter 1, verse 29. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now first we see John's vision of the person. I want you to see it. That's why I sang it this morning. First you see the vision of the person. John sees Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. First, we see John's vision of the person. And secondly, in that is a declaration, the Lamb of God. It's a declaration of his work. In other words, in a very beautiful way, the term the Lamb of God shows the beauty of his character and the fullness of his work. The Lamb of God. The Lamb. I alluded to it last week concerning the humility of the Lamb. And at the same time, in that humility is the wrath of the Lamb, which will strike terror on every living human being on a certain day on this earth, right after the sixth seal, right before the seventh. The wrath of the Lamb will be evident to everyone. And it will strike terror in every person, just like was gathered around John. The Bible says, from kings to paupers and Everything in between. The wrath of the Lamb has come. And they're fleeing to the caves, begging for death. This Lamb. Yet, what do we see in Him? The Lamb of God. It indicates meekness, gentleness, forbearance. Now, these are amazing qualities belonging to the One who's coming with such strength force, authority, and fire. Yet, John immediately saw in him, he's looking at him, and he sees his eyes, he sees this quiet demeanor, a calm countenance, no signs of vindictiveness, no signs of worldly injustice or violence. Just absolute purity and innocence of which John proclaims looking at him, behold the Lamb of God. And yet at the same time, there's so much more in this phrase that John proclaimed, the Lamb of God. Why? My friends, listen, don't miss this. All of you watching, Mark the time frame and go back from here and start again and get it all back again. The Lamb of God also speaks of sacrifice. Sacrifice. To the Jewish mind, there was no other meaning in this phrase, the Lamb, than that of sacrifice. This is why John did not say, after looking into his eyes, he could not say, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because there would have been no thought of sacrifice connected with that declaration. John knew his audience. He knew the nation. And he knew what he was speaking. I mean, my friends, even the, even the this is why I want you to get prophetic in, in your lifetime. So that you can discern even the very time frame. Not just the generation, but the very day, the very hour. Hour, the very moment you live in. John was specifically, prophetically, perfectly aware of even the timing of this moment that Jesus is approaching him. Why? Because Passover was coming 
soon. All around them now, droves of sheep being driven into Jerusalem, on the road, on the road in front of where they are, sheep everywhere. They're being driven toward Jerusalem for what? For the sacrifice. All of the people around him have an awareness of this. And John the prophet, seeing the sin of the people and discerning the timing, people aware of sacrifice and lambs being led to it to atone, he says, Behold, God's perfect lamb, the one final sacrifice for sin. You see, his word resonated with the very moments they were living in. Sacrifice. Behold, the lamb of God. The first time in the Bible we see the word lamb, the first time. It occurs in connection with the sacrifice of Isaac in the Old Testament. Centuries earlier, centuries earlier, Isaac cried out to his father Abraham, My father, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? No, the first time the word lamb occurs in the New Testament is when John the Baptist a true son of Abraham, a devout son of Abraham, announces to the multitudes of the children of Abraham, Behold, the Lamb of God. You think that's an accident? That's no mere accident. That's part of the great blessing and beauty and prophetic majesty and unity of the entire Word of God. The Old Testament first time asked the question, where is the Lamb? The New Testament first time we see it answers the question, behold the Lamb. Hallelujah! That's your Bible. That's your Bible. That's in your Bible. It's not an accident. The Old Testament, think of it. We read the Old Testament. My wife and I are going over it now every night, more and more each night. I'm going to read the, we're reading the Word together again. I know many of you do that as well. Think of it, though. Think of the Old Testament. The Old, listen to what's happening here. The Old Testament was able to produce the fire and the wood, right? Symbols of judgment. Old Testament. But the New Testament produces the perfect sacrifice. It all came together. Where is it? Where is the lamb? Behold the lamb. And by this sacrifice, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all his seed in faith in Christ might go free. John the Baptist fully knew the meaning of the word, the time in which he lived. I'm not asking you to wow John. I'm asking you to be John. I'm not preaching John the Baptist. I'm preaching the Holy Spirit in him, in you. I'm just pointing to a great example we're given of what's available to all of us. Hallelujah. He fully knew the meaning of the word, the time in which he lived, the very sound of the sheep all around them being made ready for sacrifice for sin. He declared that here at last, has appeared on the scene of humanity, the Lamb of God, the one who fulfills all the promises, all the shadows, all the types and shadows concerning the sacrifice that we learned of in the Old Testament. And finally we see those words, Behold, the Lamb of God. And it says, Who takes away the sins of the world. Now notice those words there, my friends. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Takes away. Underline that with your heart. Takes away. Now, this phrase is that of bearing or carrying. The prophet declared that there stood before them the Lamb of God who had now taken full responsibility. He has become responsible for the sin of the world. He takes it away. He carries it. He bears it. He made it his own. 
He has become responsible for it. John told them all, you've been asking since the days of Isaac, where is he? You've been asking since the days of Isaac, where is the lamb? Behold him. Behold him. Here he is, right in front of you. He who carries the sin of the world. Not the sins, but the very principle of sin. Behold the one who has made himself responsible for all that sin means. It's guilt. It's, it's penalty. He's the one that has come to atone for it. Behold the Lamb. Why is this important? The whole world is crying out for something, anything. They're all in a quest for answers, justice, social justice, all the slogans, all the terminology. What they don't realize is the very thing they've rejected is the very one who has come to set them free. The very one they're rejecting and fighting against is the Lamb of God who came and their sins were punished on His back if they would only believe it. What is your message? It's not the latest headline. It's behold the Lamb. What is your prayer? Lord, let them behold the Lamb. What is your passion? What is your dialogue? What is your witness? Behold the Lamb. We don't tie things together. We just say, behold the Lamb. We have an inward sense of it. John didn't say, hey, look around. See all the sheep being driven to Jerusalem? Now we all know why that's happening. And since you all now have an acute awareness of the sacrifice of lambs for your sin, let me now say, Christ needs no qualifier. <laughs> behold Him. There's either... There's either power in your gospel or there isn't. I can tell you something. There is power, power, wonder-working power. Amen. You just got to believe it. And stop embracing the discourse and dialogue and sentiments and emotionalisms and latest causes of the world, no matter how grand they may seem. This is our cause. The answer to every human injustice Behold the Lamb. Finally, finally, the burden is lifted off of John the Baptist's shoulders. This mighty prophet who had been heavenly, heavily, heavily burdened with an accurate sense of sin and the reality of the condition of the multitudes and the nation, John the Baptist, out of that discernment, spoke words that scorched the very conscience of the listening multitudes. And in so doing, he found the burden of it all lifted from his shoulders and carried away in a way he never could have carried it himself by the meek and gentle Lamb of God. And yet in that Lamb contained all the fury and power and judgment of the Almighty and living God. So my last question then is, do you see him today? The Lamb of God. Do you see him today? Do you see Jesus for who he fully is? John said in John chapter 1 verse 34, he said, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Lamb of God, Son of God. Two facts, one person, fully God, fully man. Fully powerful and effective, the final sacrifice. While waiting for their Messiah, and here's where I want you to help others, my friends. Here's, here's a bit of an assignment for your testimony, for your witness, for your ministry. Here's a bit of an assignment for your relationship with others. Think of it. 
All these people in this day, here in our text, just like today, while waiting for their Messiah, the eyes of many had become weary by looking for him. Waiting and looking. Waiting and looking. Waiting and looking. And looking and looking. Their eyes became weary. Others' hearts grew sick because of the hope deferred. The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Wearied eyes waiting. Sickened hearts waiting. But at last, John the Baptist, this mighty prophet of God, had seen. There he is. Not just has he seen the Lamb of God, but he sees and testifies that this is the Son of God. God has come. Emmanuel, and dwelt among us. My friends, John, in an instant, looked into the face of his Savior. This is our future. This is the future to all who will believe, all who will receive. And when men came to John, and told him of the successful preaching of Jesus while imprisoned and in difficulty, and of the growing fame of Jesus, this great man John was able to say these words, Therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Did you ever know those words were before the increase, decrease that everybody memorizes? Did you know that he first said, therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled. Let Jesus rise among the ranks. Let Jesus' fame be spread abroad. That was my purpose for coming to this earth, to herald the coming of the Lord. This joy of mine is fulfilled. Jesus must increase. I must decrease. Now, in closing, notice the calm and quiet heart of dignity in John saying that. No, notice that the, the quiet, calm dignity in this prophetic individual. No, notice what exists in him. But you know what? It's the quiet and calm dignity of a heart that has been fully satisfied because he has seen Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. May we all see John in us. May we all see his Lamb and Son of God in us. May we all see as John the Baptist had seen. And although surrounded just like John, by ever-increasing sinfulness of the hearts of the multitude and the nation, by, even though it's ever-blossoming and ever-surrounding us, may we all so recognize that in the midst of the swamp, with all its names and slogans and hatred and rage, and lawlessness, and injustice, and all the chaos, and all the sinfulness of all these activities, including pestilence, locusts, famine, rumors of wars, treachery. May we, like John, may we, like John, courageously proclaim Jesus, see Jesus, Point only to Jesus and declare that he alone is the remedy.
the deliverer, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And may we proclaim that he is coming again. Let us all say with John, the mighty prophet and voice crying in the wilderness. Let us all say with him, therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's stand together. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm just going to pray for you all and all of you listening online, listening to my voice or even seeing me through video. I pray a prayer that this word will find its way into the well-tilled soil of your heart. Mighty God, let this be the planting of the Lord that you may be glorified. For we behold you, Jesus, Lamb of God, Isaac said, where is the lamb? John said, behold him. Father, thank you for tying those together, teaching us the first time the lamb is mentioned is the question, where is he? And the first time it's mentioned in the New Testament is the answer. There he is, the lamb of God. Thank you for bringing the fire and the wood and the sacrifice. And mighty God, let us be humble yet courageous and let us seek and endeavor and desire to know you fully, the fullness of who you are, the fire that burns, and the fire that cleanses. I pray a fresh anointing upon your people, all of them here today, that they might step into this office powerfully, prayerfully, prophetically in their day, in their time, in their influence, in their relationships, in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you, dear friends. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Praise the Lord. God bless everybody. We'll see you soon. Don't forget this. Don't forget Wednesday night, ages 33 to for now. No excuse to miss Wednesday night services now. You only need to come once a month. <laughs> the other ones I'll be preaching online. All right. And the one you're at. All right. God bless you. We love you. Have a safe and blessed day, everyone. Take care.